Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it is three o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started with our office hours for today. Um, this is being recorded, so if for some reason you have to pop out and you want to get um, a recording of it, just reach out to Julie. She will get that to you as soon as it is available. Um, and as always, this training is for all of you. So if you have questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat box. Um, and also, if you are if you are daring, you can come off of mute and ask questions also. Um, and just so we kind of know who's here and you all know who else is here, if you want to drop your name, your role, and where you are working, that would be great. Because today we're going to be talking about the eligibility forms. That's our focus for today. So we'll start off with introductions of our team. Um, if you were on before everybody, a couple of people jumped off, we have Colette Sullivan as our federal programs coordinator, and Jennifer Gleason is one of the educational spe specialists on the team, and they have gone off to another meeting. So my name is Carly Thibodeau, and I joined the team about a year and a half ago, and before that, I was a teacher for 21 years, and Ashley is with me today. Hi, everybody. I'm Ashley Satry, and I joined the team about eight months ago now. I'm starting to lose count. So that's a good sign, I think. Um, <laughs> and before that, I was a special ed teacher uh, here in Maine and in Virginia for 14 years. Awesome. And Julie is here. Hi, I'm Julie Pelletier. I'm the admin support for the monitoring team. Um, I have been with the DOE for seven years now. And um, prior to that, I was admin support at a K-5 elementary school for 16 years. Excellent. Thank you very much. And I see that people are dropping names and um, roles and where they're working. I see a lot of familiar names. So hi, everyone out there. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. So we just did quick introductions. Um, we are going to go over those eligibility forms and just talk about eligibility form compliance. Um, so we're gonna start off today about what is the purpose of an IEP. And IDEA says that an IEP is to ensure that all children with disabilities have available to them a free appropriate public education and that they have services designed to meet their unique needs. And it's really about moving them back to general education um, because all students are general education students first. So just to kind of keep that in mind. And then we'll be focusing on section two of the IEP is about that disability category for the student. And so this is just that list that you see on the IEP. And each of those disability categories are outlined in MUSER with the definition and the procedure for determination. So if you ever have any questions about determining whether a student is uh, qualifies as a student with that certain disability category, that is the best place to find that information in this section of MUSER. Um, and then just the definition of a student with a disability is someone that has reached the age of three years, hasn't graduated from high school with a diploma or reached the age of 22, They've been observed in the learning environment and they've been evaluated according to the rules listed in MUSER and been identified as having one of those disabilities, uh, one or more of those disabilities as outlined in MUSER. And then just the two links at the bottom take you to the administrative letter from 2021 about that change in ending age. And then the second link takes you to where that became law effective um, October 25th of 2023. Okay. So the disability categories, um, when you are thinking about a student and whether or not they qualify for special education, um, they, the student needs to be eligible under one of those disability categories. And it would be based off of that initial or reevaluation. So you would be using one of these eligibility forms at that initial eligibility meeting and those reevaluation meetings as well to make sure the eligibility is still appropriate. Um, so when you are 
conducting those meetings, you would be using one of the forms. You would either be using the adverse effect form, the specific learning disability form, or the speech or language impairment form. And those are the three forms that we're going to be going through today. And then in MUSER, this is the section where it talks about the procedure for determination of adverse effect on educational performance. You would be using this adverse effect form for these disability eligibility categories, such as autism, deafness, developmental delay, emotional disturbance. So this entire list here, if you are suspecting one of those disabilities, you would be using the adverse effect form. So the adverse effect form does not apply for students with deaf blindness, multiple disabilities, and specific learning disability because specific learning disability has its own form. Now, I know speech or language impairment is up there under that adverse effect. And we have in Maine, the specific speech or language impairment eligibility form, which you would use if you are suspecting speech or language impairment. Um, and there's an adverse effect component within that form, which I think is why it's listed here, where you're thinking about that adverse effect. Okay. And then just the definition in MUSER where it outlines adverse effect is uh, commonly means harmful, impeding, obstructing, or detrimental to adversely affect means to have a negative impact that is more than a minor or transient hindrance evidenced by findings and observations based on data sources and objective assessments with replicable results. So it does outline that definition in MUSER of adverse effect. Okay, so today we're going to be referencing information from the procedural manual because the procedural manual is a great um, tool if you don't already have it. The blue link at the top of the slide will take you to the procedural manual and you can uh, download that and keep a copy on your computer or you can print it off as well um, if you like to have a hard copy. But the procedural manual does go through each of these forms um, with directions and instructions and a lot of what I'm going to go over today is taken from the procedural manual. So we're gonna start right off with that determination of adverse effect and that's on page six of the procedural manual. So the first thing when we're thinking about compliance for these eligibility forms is just making sure that these things are checked off. So the first thing on the adverse effect form is that reason for the use of the form one of those has to be checked. Either you're doing it for initial eligibility or continuing eligibility slash dismissal because you would also use this form if you were dismissing a student that no longer qualifies for special education services. And so that this is a screenshot from a document that's kind of like a checklist of don't forget to do these things. So you can see in red, it says document reason for use of form. So just check, make sure you do that. And that's how you would do that is by checking one of those. And then, um, so the adverse effect form is about determining the eligibility for special ed services, um, or if you're considering a change in eligibility for special ed services, because this form is used for so many el eligibility categories or disability categories, if you were thinking that the student is no longer um, let's say OHI, and now you're thinking that maybe it's due to autism or something like that, you would want to complete this form, even if you are thinking that it would go from one disability to another. Um, and then again, I kind of already mentioned this, but you would also use this form if you were thinking about dismissal from special ed services. Um, and again, this is just a list of those categories where the adverse effect form would be used for those disability categories. All right, the next part on the adverse effect form, um, you just wanna make sure that you are documenting the conversation or completion of the form in the written notice. That is one of the things that we look for, for compliance. So down below is just, I put it in section five of the written notice. You can put it wherever. We will find it wherever it is in the written notice, but just, somewhere in the written notice, make a statement such as this, 
that the IEP team completed the adverse effect form and determined that this is my pretend student, Paige Turner, qualifies for special education services. Um, just something in there that the team completed the form. All right, then uh, as we move into the questions as part of the adverse effect form, just thinking about the whole form itself, you must fill in all of the sections of the form. There shouldn't be any blank boxes or areas and we're going to go over each section so you'll get an idea of what that means. Um, and just make sure to correct the check the correct box when you're asked yes, no, or NA. Um, a lot of times when we are checking over forms um, and we see verification in the box, but yes, no, or NA aren't checked at all. Sometimes that happens. We know it's probably just a typo, but we have to mark that as not compliant. So it's just one of those things, maybe ask a colleague to kind of skim over it so, you know, those little misses don't happen. Um, and then just making sure that all of those verification boxes include a data source, such as an evaluation or assessment and data whenever applicable. Um, and then you need that verification, whether you check yes or no. And I think that is sometimes confusing because we I've seen it where people check yes and they put verification, but then they'll check no and they don't put anything thinking, oh, it didn't qualify, so I don't need to put verification. Um, if you check NA, that means it's not applicable on this form. So that means you don't have verification that would lead you to yes or no. So you would have no um, verification in those boxes that are checked NA. Okay, I noticed that there are a couple of questions coming into chat. So what if the student was reevaluated and evaluator did not forward the ADHD diagnosis, student was under OHI, is the adverse effect form still needed since the diagnosis was no longer applicable? Um, I think that that would be an IEP team decision because if you were, it depends on what you were looking for when you were asking for reevaluation, um, I would think if they were under OHI due to ADHD, that that would be reassessed naturally. But I mean, that's really an IEP team decision, what those evaluations look like and how, when you're filling out this form, what eligibility category you're looking at. And then NA is not applicable not available or not applicable. Children under five don't take some of the tests asked for on the regular AE form. Right, it's not applicable. So if you had no information about that certain question, then you Harley, would have... it's it's not available on the AE form. It's not available, no, not, not applicable. Sorry, I'm using the wrong word, aren't I? Yes, I yep. am, sorry about that. Because okay. it says right here on the screen that you all are looking at. So don't listen to my words. It's been a day. It's been a long day. So sorry about that. Okay. So here's your the first question on the adverse effect form. So in each one of these, you can see that there is a question. So this one asks about uh, standard or percentile scores on nationally normed, individually administered achievement tests. And so some examples for three to five-year-olds, maybe that WIPSI or ADOS, and then we have the K to 12, where you've got the Woodcock Johnson, the Wyatt, the Owls, the Gort. And uh, it's been a while since I've had to fill one of these forms out, and the procedural manual it is a little bit outdated also. So if we say some assessments or evaluations that aren't applicable anymore, like people aren't using them, um, just use whatever you know assessments would kind of be similar ones to those. Um, so you would check yes or no or NA and fill in your data sources with data. This one, question two, is about standard or percentile scores on nationally normed group administered achievement tests. So this is where you could put examples um, from NWAs, PSATs, SATs, other 
nationally normed group administered achievement tests. If you had scores from those, that's where these would go. Question three is around any reports prepared by the SAU or presented by the parent guardian that reflect academic or functional performance. Um, so you have your three to five-year-olds. These are some examples that ABAS, CDS, eligibility observation summary. Um, for K to 12, those could include Vineland scores, ABAS scores, academic grades, reports by parents or outside providers, or uh, standards-based systems. All right, question four um, is about the child's performance on comprehensive assessments based on a system of learning results or the Common Core as of 2014. Um, and so here for three to five-year-olds, some examples of sources would be the AEPS, the high scope child observation record. Um, and then for K to 12, this could be that main through year assessment, which is the old MEAs, um, NWAs, writing prompts, curriculum-based measures. And there are some examples there of those curriculum-based measures that you could use. Number five are about criterion referenced assessments of academic or functional performance. So some data sources could be the VB map, the ABLES, the Brigant's inventory of early development, school function assessment, NWAs made through your assessment, classroom test scores. So you can see some of those assessments or evaluations can be used in multiple places within this form, as long as they um, meet the question criteria. Number six is about whether the child's work product, products, language samples, or portfolios demonstrate adverse effect. So we have some examples here, writing prompts, handwriting samples, portfolios of work, classroom work samples, things like that could go here. Number seven, does disciplinary um, evidence or rating scales based on system systemic observations um, in more than one setting whenever possible. So these could be disciplinary reports or office reports or referrals, um, FBAs that have been completed, BAS rating scales, brief behavior data, sheets or logs, classroom observations. And then do the child's attendance patterns demonstrate adverse effect? So if you're saying yes or no here, then you just want to include data sources such as attendance records. So either putting their attendance if they've been there most of the time or they've missed a lot of school, however, however that looks for that student. Then number nine is about the child's social or emotional deficits, if any observed by professionals or parents, guardians in multiple settings. So some examples for this one could be that BASC again, the brief, the Achenbach, Connors rating scales, multi-dimensional anxiety scale for children, autism rating scales, observations, that peers, Harris self-concept scale. So any of those that give you information about their social or emotional deficits. And then number 10 is that other. So if you don't have any other, just check that NA. If you do, check the yes, no, and make sure to fill in that verification. All right, I'm just going to finish up the last couple of things before I go to the chat box for questions. So um, then after you've gone through all those questions, you have this, was only one assessment data source considered? So just make sure you check yes or no. If you did check yes, you need to explain why that was adequate having only one data source. Um, and then moving on, has the IEP team determined that there is an adverse effect? Then you would check yes, no, make sure you check the correct one. And then, excuse me, if the answer is yes, you go to section three. If the answer is no, then the child does not qualify as a child with a disability under MUSER. So remember, if you checked yes, 
then you go to section three. And this is where you would say that the adverse effect that the that results from the child's disability is to such a degree that they require special education or it's correctable through accommodations in the child's regular education program. So you need to make sure you check one of those boxes and then include a summary of why you checked the box above. Okay, any questions? So I'm gonna go back to chat and it looks like we have a couple. Oh, I answered one, that's always a good thing. Um, classroom work samples, we can use work students do. Yes, classroom work samples would be the student the from what they are doing in class. Yep. Sample, can you state that samples were reviewed without including the actual samples? Yes, you can say that you used classroom samples and it the classroom sample does not need to be in the verification box. Student has identification of OHI due to anxiety. If a student was reevaluated and the team determined that the SLD math was the greater area of deficit, do we fill out both forms? The student is now managing anxiety and no longer requires social work services. There is no official diagnosis of anxiety. This student transferred to our school and I do not recall any other diagnosis. Yes, so this would be a dismissal situation where the student was identified as OHI due to anxiety. So you would fill out the adverse effect form showing that there's no longer an adverse effect. And then you would fill out the SLD form to um, determine that specific learning disability format. So we have a little quiz now. So here we have, this is really small. I'm sorry, it's so little, but to get the whole thing on the page, I had to make it like this, um, but I tried to put the things in red. So here you can see that number one, there's a red X on no. So we filled out the form. We've said, no, this is not an adverse effect. So what is wrong with this? Why is this not compliant? If we were looking at this, and I'll give you a little hint, there's something else on this page that is also missing. So if you notice it, right, we do need verification in that box. There is no verification right now. Right, and the reason for the use of the form is not checked exactly. That's why I had to make it so little so I could get that in there with it. Um, so you got both of those. So very good, excellent. So here you wanna make sure you're checking one of those boxes at the top, don't forget that. And then even if you check no, you want to put that verification in there. So excellent job. All right. Now we're moving on to our specific learning disability eligibility form. So again, procedural manual, great resource, has all of the information about all of these forms. Um, so here's that top part, the beginning part of the specific learning disability form. And again, just remembering to document the conversation or completion of the form in the written notice. So here's that example of, again, how you can just make that statement. Um, and this time Paige Turner qualifies for special ed as a with a specific learning disability, but the team did complete the form. And again, you can put it anywhere in the written notice. I just happened to choose number five. Don't ask me why. Um, okay, and so here is a link to the guidance document from MASP, the main association, association of school psychologists, because this is going to be your best resource when filling out the specific learning disability eligibility form, because it is a little bit of a tricky form and yes it there's a lot to it and i believe if jennifer's still here if she came if she's back in here i'm pretty sure she's i've heard that yeah. they are oh okay it, masp is the one are they are the ones that developed this form is that correct yes and they do trainings every now and then on it 
Okay, excellent. So yes, it's a this is a useful document when you're trying to make your way through this form. And your psychologist also is going to be a huge asset when you are completing this form at the IEP meeting. So they will be able to help you out with that as well. So here we have this part A of the SLD form. So again, just remember when you're looking at each of the questions, you want to make sure that you're filling in each question and there are no blank boxes or areas. And the SLD form is very thorough because under each question, it actually says, if the answer to question one is yes, you do this. If the answer to question one is no, you do this. And I know it is a lot of reading when you're in the middle of a meeting trying to fill this all out with people, um, but it really does guide you through completing the form. Um, so when you're filling out number one, and this one gets me every time because it asks if the evidence from multiple valid and reliable sources demonstrate that the child is ac achieving adequately for the child's age and is meeting state approved grade level standards in all of the areas below. This is actually supposed to be no. And sometimes we get yes checked and then we have the things checked off and showing those areas of deficit or areas of need. So just making sure you check the correct box because the wording is a little funny. So this is really supposed to be no. And then just checking off those areas and including the data source, which is that evaluation or assessment and the data, those scores whenever possible. Um, and again, this is needed if it is checked yes or no. Then going on to number two, same idea, make sure you're checking yes or no. Um, and here are some examples. These are some examples from the procedural manual about what might go in this verification box, about um, considering attendance, identifying methodologies, not the results of gen ed interventions, um, consider teacher appropriate certification, culturally and linguistically include instruction consistent with assessments used to measure academic achievement. So, and I think this one has many more examples um, in the procedural manual, I just kind of plucked a few out of there. Um, and then number three is where you go through the check yes, no about all of the kind of rule outs, right? But this form is asking whether or not the child has the intellectual disability, emotional disturbance, hearing disability, etc but whether any such disability is a primary cause of the child's failure to achieve adequately. So if you say that, yes, they have an emotional disturbance, that doesn't mean that they, okay, I'm gonna say this wrong, hold on. So, no, okay, so right, if you say yes, then they would not qualify for a specific learning disability on here. But if they do have an emotional, emotional disturbance, but it is not the primary cause of the child's failure to achieve, then you would check no here. Even if they do have an emotional disturbance, it isn't their primary. If you are filling this out and you are thinking, and you all think that SLD is the primary, then this would be checked no, even though they have an emotional disturbance or intellectual disability. It is a little confusing. Um, okay, so hopefully that came out right. All right, and then number four, this is where we see a lot of trickiness too because many people forget to check yes, no at the top of this. And so then when we look at that, that would be marked as not compliant. So just remembering to check if does the child exhibit a pattern of strengths and weaknesses in performance achievement or both and it goes on. So you have to say, yes, they have a uh, pattern of strengths and weaknesses or no, they don't. And the verification down below is where you fill in showing those patterns of strengths and weaknesses. Um, and so in each of those boxes, there needs to be some kind of data source and data um, to verify those strengths and weaknesses.
Number five is about relevant behavior noted during the observation and its relationship to academic functioning. Um, and this is necessary because in MUSER, it says that part of the specific learning disability, disability category, there must be an observation completed within their learning environment and there needs to be documentation. So this is where you include that documentation and summarize those relevant findings from that observation. And then number six is educationally relevant medical findings. Um, this is a must fill, but if there isn't anything, it is okay to just put NA or none, but this is where you would put anything if it's related to ADHD or any kind of, any other kind of health or mental health information. All right, then Carly, if we say Carly can ask a question. Yeah. Uh, can you go back up to seven? If we say so if, if a parent says to us, you know, that they have a diagnosis of anxiety, they're seeing a, a community based counselor and we say yes here, we, we say that right or a tick disorder, whatever it might be. Are we required to have medical documentation to support that in our files? Uh, for this question right here where you're just putting in the notes? Yep. Um, I I don't think so. I think you could put, um, if the parent is reporting that you have the, that okay. the student has Thank those you. things, then you can in put Maine, that in. in Maine, you don't ever need me a medical diagnosis. It's based on the evaluations. I, I understand that, but sometimes we don't have that medical documentation and a parent just makes that note you, you, we're believing the parent. I'm not to saying that we're not to believe the parent, but you know, I mean, there's no, so I was just making sure that if, if we're saying that the parent noted the student has had a history of generalized yeah. anxiety disorder, you know, and that's not, you know, we're not asking for backup on that. That's all. So thank you. I'm hearing yes. no. Yeah, right. Thanks. I You can put that in here in the notes. Yep. Okay, then moving on to this part B is where all the team makes the decision about whether that specific learning disability exists. So just making sure to check yes, no correctly, whichever the team decides. And there are specific directions if yes. So if you are saying yes, that the student, that there is a specific learning disability, that it exists, then you can see question one has to be no, question two has to be no, all parts of question three have to be no, four must be yes, seven must be yes, and then once you say yes here, you move on to number nine. And if any of those other, if any of those are not correct, like if one, two, or any part of three is yes, then question four must be no, and so then this becomes a no. So, then we move on here and we have, if there is a learning disability, the disability is of such nature and degree that the child requires special education and related services, or it can be adequately addressed through general ed interventions and or accommodations. So make sure you check the one that the team has determined. Um, and then, and you can see those directions here also, if you check yes, this, and so on. Um, and then the team members must sign this. And I know that this is a really tricky thing now, especially because we went through, well, and it was even trickier, I think when we were in the throes of COVID and everyone was remote, but there must be signatures. This is an IDEA. This is the one form that needs to be signed by the team members. So whomever participated in the meeting, needs to be able to sign this document, whether it's DocuSign or some other electronic form signature, however you all do that. Um, and if you don't have that available, um, I know we've given guidance to like make a copy of the signature page, send it home for signature, and then get it back and, you know, attach it with the other signatures. Um, so, but it does, we do have to see the signatures along with this form. All right, any questions about the specific 
learning disability eligibility form. Okay, so I see a question came up. Our school psychologist had emergency surgery. Can we have the meeting to review the evaluation without her present? Yes, you can have someone uh, present the information from the evaluation if they are able to do that. Um, and then uh, sometimes there's an excusal form. I don't know if we need that for the evaluators or if you can just go over that evaluation, but there is an excusal form in the procedural manual if you need that. Uh, clarify that it says performance achievement or both. And can you tell me which question that was? I, I'm not sure. Yes. Um, on question four. Yes. Under the pattern of strengths and weaknesses, it says in performance achievement or both. Yes. And so that leads me to believe that you don't have to have something in both achievement and performance boxes in both strengths and weaknesses. But then on the other hand, I'm being told that you have to have something in both boxes. So why is there an or? That is a great question. <laughs> and our team is going to discuss that very soon. Okay. And we, will, we will get a better answer then that is a very good question because you're right it does say performance achievement or both and if you go into that mask guidance document there's a little oops sorry there's a little visual and i think the visual is in the procedural manual too i should have added it to this powerpoint i don't know why i didn't but anyway um and it talks about or both and so they're there's like this little arrow thing. It's like achievement to this, achievement to age, achievement to um, intellectual. And so it's or for all three of those things. And you're right. So it does, it does lead to the question of those boxes. Definitely. Yes. Yeah, I found it confusing. Yeah. I have another question, but I'll see if anybody else has a question first. Okay. <laughs> Um, nothing else has come up in chat. Okay. So I think you're right. So this has, also has to do with the whole strength and weaknesses. Okay. I've had a number of kids who um, at one point, you know, when they were first identified with a learning disability, math was a strength. But then after COVID, math is no longer a strength. Mm. And so they, several of them have had really good listening comprehension. And we had a lot of classroom data to support that, but on the tests that are done on a regular basis, like either the Woodcock-Johnson Achievement Test or the Wyatt, um, the listening comprehension section isn't one that is normally done. Mm. And so, but I think that would have been a strength for them. Mm -hmm. Do you mm -hmm. have any just um, feedback or guidance around that? Um. <laughs> I, I do not. I mean, if you know your students and when you're requesting evaluations and if you can request to have those areas completed that you think would show a strength, I mean, I, yeah, it's definitely up to the IEP team and how they want to parse out those strengths and weaknesses for the student. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. That's a, that's not a very good answer. I don't feel like. <laughs> okay. This is a really confusing form. <laughs> it, it, it is. Yes. I would agree. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So we have another little quiz and this may be up for debate because, you know, we just kind of talked about this section, but this is not compliant and just pretend I have data sources and data there because I was not in any frame of mind to think of real data sources and data to stick in these boxes. I apologize. So just pretend there's a bunch of things there. Um, so why would this not be compliant as we're talking right now um, based off of what we've said? Right. So there are no strengths listed in that one box. Yep. And yes, the check mark is missing for the yes, no. Someone caught that. See, that's the little thing. It's, it's easy to miss. 
Right. So it wasn't checked and that 4A is blank, that strength side. So when we're when we are looking at the forms right now, we're making sure that we have the yes, no checked. And right now we're looking for all of those boxes to be filled in with some kind of verification. Okay. So we're going to move on to our final eligibility form, which is our speech or language impairment eligibility form. And again, this is in the procedural manual. And just like with the SLD form, where you can really use your psychologists to help you work through that, this speech or language form, really you can rely on your speech and language therapists to you know, help you navigate this form as well. Um, this is what the beginning of it looks like. And just a reminder, document in the written notice that the IEP team completed that eligibility form. Um, so it's somewhere in there. Okay, so again, this is kind of small. I apologize, but to try to fit this whole thing together, I had to make it smaller. So on this front page, where these four questions are, you want to make sure that all of these are completed. So you want to have yes, no checked one or the other for each of the areas, um, articulation, language, fluency, and voice. And there should be verification in each of those boxes, um, even if they don't qualify or it's a no, um, and there were assessments done, you would want to put those data sources and the data that support that there is no language impairment. So show those average scores or you know the ones that they didn't qualify for. Um, and of course you want them for the ones that yes, they do qualify. Um, and if you're checking no because the area was not assessed, uh, then even in that verification on this front part, just put something in there like no assessment needed or not an area of suspected disability, something like that, just so that people know from first glance. Um, then you have this question about does a speech or language impairment exist? So you would check that correct box, yes or no. And then this is where that adverse effect comes in. Does the child's speech or language impairment adversely affect his or her educational performance? And you would put your yes, no, and then fill in that information about how you know it's adversely affecting them. And these are some sources of data, may include classroom grades, child work products, measures of attainment of literacy standards, so on and so forth. So there are several examples here where you could get your verification from. And then we have, if there is a speech or language impairment, the impairment is such is of such nature and degree that the child requires special education, or it can be adequately addressed through gen ed interventions and or accommodations. So making sure you check the correct one of those and just verifying this is why they need special education or this is why they can be addressed through accommodations. And then when we look at this form, we also need to see all of those severity rating scales because the severity rating scales are really what drives those answers to the questions one through four on that first page. So when you're filling out um, the articulation severity rating scale, if you're not, if this was not assessed, then you check that very top box where it says no articulation assessment needed. If it was assessed, that's where you fill out the bottom grid part. And they have to fall within that moderate to severe range to say yes on that first question on the on the first page, number one on the first page. And then over here, you can see informal assessment for a five-year-old. You would use ages three to five if they are still with CVS or you would use ages five through 20 for if they were with the SAU. So just a little side note. The language severity rating scale, same idea. If language was not assessed, it would just, you check that top box, no language assessment needed. And then the bottom grid would be filled in if there was an assessment completed. Then we have the fluency severity rating scale, same idea. 
No fluency assessment needed. If you check that, nothing else needs to be filled in. If that isn't checked, then you should complete the grid down below. And then there's another little note about children in CDS. A standardized assessment is not required. Alternative assessment procedures such as clinical observations can be utilized to score the description of fluency. So that is for CDS. And the last one, the voice severity rating scale. Again, if there was no voice assessment needed, just check that box at the top. Nothing else needs to be done here. If there was a voice assessment completed, you would fill out that bottom grid. Um, and then just a little note, voice impairment is a medical condition and the diagnosis from a physician is required. Okay. Any questions? Okay, I don't see anything in the chat. So here's our final little quiz. Here's our speech or language eligibility form. So this is what it looks like. Why is this not compliant if we were looking at this form? Right, no verification for number three and four. And what are the scores exactly? Yes. So this one, I know this might've been a little confusing because on the last one, I just put data and scores and said, ignore that. This one really is, should have scores here. So it doesn't have data and the verification doesn't have the scores. Um, so instead, when you're filling in that information, make sure you fill in that assessment and the score that supports that or um, for any of those that were completed. And then if it's a no because it wasn't an assessment done, just making a note that it wasn't assessed or it wasn't a sus suspected disability, something to that effect. Yeah. Okay. A couple of questions that we've had in the past about eligibility forms. Do all the questions on the adverse effect form have to be answered? And yes, but that NA means not available. Yes, thank you for correcting me with that. So there's no data to support the yes, no, then NA would be checked. Um, do the eligibility forms need to be completed during the IEP team meeting? And that's yes. They do need to be completed as a team. And that's why we look for that statement in the written notice that the form was completed at the meeting or a conversation about the form was com was held. Um, and then again, just a reminder that that SLB form must be signed by all the team members. And then here are some resources. So we have that procedural manual has all of these forms. That's where the majority of this information came from. Um, the main unified special ed regulations, those will outline the definitions of each disability category and the procedures for determination. So it's really useful for that and oh, everything else, special ed. Um, our IEP quick reference document. I know we weren't really talking about IEP today, but we always throw that link in here just so you have it. And then we have our professional development calendar where you can find other office hours or any of our other PD that we do, um, links to recordings and PowerPoints that we've done in the past and a bunch of other resources. So those are there for you. Uh, these are professional development topics that we've done already this school year. The blue links will take you to the recordings. The other ones have been recorded. We just haven't gotten them uploaded to our website yet. They will be soon. and. Yes, we are up to the end of March, which is hard to believe. So we have a little Q&A on Friday if anybody's got questions and they want to come meet with us and get some answers. Okay, then we have a few professional development that we would love for you to share. Um, we always love that you share our professional development regardless, but these ones could be useful for gen ed teachers. We're doing one in April around special ed law for gen ed teachers. 
And we did one back in April, uh, October around discipline and manifestation determination, which is recorded and on our website. Then we have a couple, no, we have one. Our writing measurable functional goals has been done in February and we're getting that onto the website. It isn't there yet, but um, we have one coming up in May around consultation and related service goals. So invite your related service providers. And here is our feedback form, our link to our feedback form. We'll try to, there we go. And I'm gonna drop it in chat. And we love feedback. We really do look at it and try to use it as much as possible. Um, so if you fill that out and request a contact hour, you will get a contact hour for to attending today's office hours. Um, just make sure you type your email in correctly and it will get to you. And then we have, oh, the main DOE just has some social media links out there and our website for the whole Department of Education. And this is our contact information. One last time, because we are always here if you need anything. If you have questions, we are here to do our best to answer those. And we, um, I'm going to drop the slides in here again. I know some people came in a little bit later. I had dropped them at the very beginning. Um, but I'll also send them out with an email with your contact hour, if you request a contact hour. But yes, we're always here if you wanna reach out and ask questions. We always say, if you have hypotheticals like on IEP goals or things like that, and you want feedback, we will give feedback around goals um, as long as they're hypothetical, nothing on an actual IEP, leave out student information, things like that. But yeah. Carly, uh, I, there's a couple of questions if you scroll up a little bit in okay, the sure. chat right. box, I think. Who is typically responsible for filling in these forms in your districts? Oh, I feel like that might be to all of you folks. So if you want to let Gail know who is typically responsible for filling in the eligibility forms in your districts, she would be grateful. And then I have some questions about adverse effect. I'm not sure if this is the venue to ask those. Sure. You can ask questions. I'm going to stop sharing, I think. And then if you want That's to me. ask. Yes. Okay. Okay. So um, a question about weight. So like um, we have a psych eval that um, gives some information, but we might also have some other information like um say the student testing looking average, but their work product really looks two years behind. Should one thing have more weight than another? That is an IEP team decision. So you all will fill out the form. And then once you have your information in there, um, verifying the yeses and the noes, and if there's an adverse effect, that's, that's up to the team to decide. Okay, um, but you can, so it's not like the psych eval would definitely outweigh any other evidence because it's an, uh, a eval that's given by a psychologist with standardized testing. We, there are other avenues to, to show evidence that could also count. Correct, and okay. as you can see on that adverse effect form, you can see that there are those work samples, you know, there are those other places where you can include data from outside those evaluations. Yep. And, and okay, because it wouldn't outweigh it. So then you don't have the psych eval, but you would have to have overwhelming evidence to maybe contradict that. It doesn't have to be that level of. Um, right. Data. It doesn't have to be like a standardized evaluation or standardized assessment. Is that what you're asking? Like, yeah, well, I feel like it's yeah. hard sometimes in a, in a psych eval, um, a student could test, uh, say, good in something, but you know, their everyday work product is, is mm -hmm. measures kind of a different thing. So you could show that impact there where, oh, yikes, I know they did good in the psych eval, but the, you know, the everyday work product they're writing is like, say, two years behind or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Is there a standard of that? Does it have to be a certain level behind? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. 
Okay. Um, mm -hmm. I know I had one more quick thing. I don't want to monopolize the time. Um, and, and discipline data we can also use. Like, so at my school, we uh, track things like office discipline referrals or um, screening on a um, social emotional scale. Those kind of data are also okay to use. Right there. Yep. There is a section on the adverse effect form about the disciplinary stuff. Okay. I really appreciate your time. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Hey, any other questions before we wrap up for today? And thank you all to uh, people that have been talking to each other in chat and kind of answering each other's questions. It's always helpful. All right. Well, if there are no other questions, have a great Carly, afternoon. Yes. There's just one follow-up question from Tina just around uh, yep. needing Thank you. permission. Yep. Sorry. That's okay. It's the last one in the chat if you can see it. Oh, okay. Oh, would the parent have to sign off stating gave permission to not have school psych or could I just document in written notice? I don't that's know. For the, I, that's for the school psychologist to not be there to review the evals. Right, the evaluation. Correct. I am not sure. There's. I know that there's a parent excusal form for a team member not being there, but I don't know if a psychologist that was going to report out on an evaluation qualifies as that. Jennifer, do you know? Or Ashley? I mean... I know I, music I think says that it just has to be somebody who's qualified to review the evaluation and then it doesn't have to be the school psych. Um, so I think the only reason they would need the excusal would be if the school psychologist was invited to the meeting and then couldn't come. Is that, Jennifer, I'll have you weigh in on that part, but. I mean, you could always have the parent sign the excusal and then, you know, better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. Um, so, the kind of education, so the special education teacher can give the reports of the evals, right? Because we kind of got into an emergency situation where our school psych had emergency surgery and we have these evaluations and I've been waiting to have the meetings and finally they're like, we need to have these without her. I think as long as the person who is reviewing them understands them, understands the scores. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And we'll see you next time.